So whilst we're waiting for a few of the others to come down, uh, who here is having their first year at Foss Talk Live? Hands up, it's a warm, oh, wow. safe place. Wow. wow, look at all you new people. This is brilliant. Okay, and of you right. newbies... Everyone introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't do that. Um, who here is unfamiliar with the Ubuntu podcast? Hey, that's pretty good. Get, yeah, put your hand down. Wow, okay. You've presented it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, really? This, that's a first, I think. It's the first time we've had an audience that actually knows what this is all about. So, uh, uh, kind of redundant, but we'll go through it anyway. Uh, I'm Martin. Uh, I'm one of the presenters of the Ubuntu podcast. Uh, Mark appeals to our younger demographic. Uh, <laughs> and the I'm not, I'm not sure how. Uh, and, also, and also keeps uh, Alan and I, Alan is uh, the handsome fellow on the end here. Hello. Uh, keeps Alan and I in check because we are the shills of the Ubuntu podcast, given that we both actually work for Canonical. Um, although we didn't plan it quite like that. It just kind of worked yes. out that way. Ten uh, years it's a very good way this. to get a job at Canonical, it yeah. turns out. It so at this Ten point, we'd, uh, we'd like to extend our thanks, as usual, to uh, Late Night Linux for being our warm-up act. I think they did a, <laughs> uh, um, a, 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 a modest job <laughs> this year. I ended on a bit of a downer. We've got to do a bit more work to lift you all up and get smiles on faces. Um, but welcome. Come on down. Seats at the front. <laughs> Maybe. You'll, well, know, you'll know when it starts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, usually, you'll get usually, flashbacks um, to 1927. For, the <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for those of you who've heard the Ubuntu podcast before, you'll know that when we record, we have a silent presenter who's called Samantha, and she plays in our stings. Unfortunately, Samantha can't be with us this evening, so uh, Joe Ressington will be playing the part of Samantha tonight. So a big hand for Joe Ressington in the corner, who's going to be a stand-in stand -in Samantha. So when, when you see us nod, obviously, at Joe, uh, that's Joe being uh, 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 cued to play in the stings. Yep. A bit. So, Mark. Uh, yeah, so um, if, you, if you like what you see and you want to share it with the world, um, <laughs> please take photos, post them on Twitter, use the Foss Talk hashtag, tag at Ubuntu Podcast, um, and you can post photos to the Ubuntu Podcast Telegram channel, which we have at ubuntupodcast.org slash Telegram. Yeah. The other thing that I need to say is that normally when we start doing the show, we count one, two, three, and then we all say biscuits together, which uh, allows us to sync up our audio. Now, unfortunately, we didn't bring biscuits tonight, so... I'm yeah. sorry, but so what we're going to do is we're going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say one, two, three, and then we're all going to say no biscuits. So can we do that? One, two, three, no, no biscuits. biscuits. Well, very good. Very good. Are we in sync now? Yes. Yeah. Perfectly. Okay. And then what we also need to do is insert a small ripple of applause into the show in a very BBC British way. So uh, I would really like to call for you now to do a small ripple of applause and then Joe will play us in, please. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Ubuntu podcast at Foss Talk Live! Yay! My name's Mark and joining me this week are Martin. Hello. And Alan. Hello you. <laughs> Martin, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? Uh, well, I have just arrived back from Prague where Ooh. I have been attending the Electron Maintainers Summit at the Microsoft offices in Prague hosted by GitHub. Well, oh. that didn't take long, did it? <laughs> 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 so what happens at an Electron Maintainers Summit? Um, it, it's the place where about 50 or 60 people get together and decide the direction of Electron as a technology platform. Is, uh, do they also have people from major memory manufacturers and <laughs> CP, <laughs> CPU vendors there? Yes, we did get a tote bag with 16 gigabytes of memory. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was a good event actually. Um, so uh, I learned quite a lot at that event, uh, and and it was an interesting conversation. She will be pleased to hear uh, some of the topics of discussion were how to make Electron smaller, how to make it less uh, CPU intensive, how to reduce its uh, memory footprint. So. Uh, Encouragement to all of you that the Electron maintainers are in fact aware. <laughs> <laughs> They're not oblivious to the fact that Electron is a big fat CPU RAM hog, and they want to do something about that. Great. How was Prague? 
it's delightful. They have good beer in Prague. Oh, I went, and, I went and <laughs> it was remarkably hot as well. It was yes. like being on holiday. I went to great. Prague on a business studies trip when I was at, uh, I was at college and we went on a brewery tour. Right, yes, yes, I, I did a couple of those. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> Alan, thank you, <laughs> Microsoft. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what have you been up to, Alan? Um, so I spent the week in the office. Oh, wow. Uh, which is really unusual for me because, as those of you who listen to the show know, uh, I work from home and it's very unusual for me to go in the office. But this week we had a design sprint and it was really interesting for me because I've never sat in on a design sprint. We were doing some... Um, do, they, do they normally lock the door and not let you come in? Uh, well, I don't have a Mac. So no. uh, <laughs> when we no, walk you, in, you they do hide have the crayon. A Mac. <laughs> well, I, for the purposes of humour, let's say we don't. Uh, I, so uh, we went into the uh, into this design sprint, and I had no idea what was going on. And the plan was for us to create some mock-up designs for a popular application on the Linux desktop, GNOME Software Center. The uh, you know the thing where people download applications. So we were going to do some mock-ups for GNOME Software, and uh, it was impressive i had no idea what goes on when you design an application <laughs> having never designed an application and it was a really cool process of um iterating over stuff that a whole bunch of us had whiteboards on the wall post-it notes stickers and stuff trying to like um figure out what the best uh, of you know th- all of us could come up with like everyone was coming up with different ideas of how to present applications in an app store and um yeah, it turns out we came up with some good ideas. Cool. So maybe so that will feature on a desktop. Can you, can, you give us, can you give us a sneak preview of what's coming in GNOME software? Uh, not really. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's not up to me. We came up with all the, the design stuff, but it's up to the, the maintainers of GNOME software to decide whether they accept those designs and whether they want to implement them. Cool. But, uh, yeah, it was quite cool being in part of a design for an application that lots and lots and lots of people use. Yeah, it's pretty cool. What about you? What have you been up to? Uh, I've been fixing my toilet. Oh, yeah. the saga continues. So this was this was the final thing in my bathroom, which was still leaking very it was slightly. The final thing. I yeah. would think the toilet's the first yeah. thing you do, isn't it? It was the final thing that was still leaking. All right, okay. Everything else was fixed, but the toilet. And in fact, no, the toilet. You is last left thing. The, the toilet, toilet is... leaking. I I had a tray under it. <laughs> It wasn't was leaking. It, like it wasn't up? leaking when we put it in. Now, it, Mark, ke- it, we we discovered the leak a few days after we thought it was okay, and right. then it turned out it was leaking. And so now we fixed the leak, and everything is watertight, and I can finish my bathroom. Right. Mark reliably informs me he's going to be giving a presentation at Og Camp this year to retell the saga of how you fix your bathroom like a programmer. Yes. <laughs> wow. So look forward to that. Yeah. Shall we uh, get on with the news? Let's, Let's. do that. Oh, it's me. Uh, <laughs> and so it's time for the news. Now, the news is very depressing at the moment. So we thought rather than look at all the horrible, depressing news there is at the moment, we'd go back in time. So step into our time trumpet and we'll go... <laughs> well done, everyone. Yes. On message. Brilliant. <laughs> I didn't even have to ask for that. Everyone was time trumpeting away. Uh, Martin, what's first in our... Back to the Future news. Well, I'm, I'm going to take you back to 1978, so 40 years ago when the CPU wars were just getting underway. It's before um, you were born, Mark. Yeah. Was it? Thanks yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and it's the 40th anniversary of the original Intel 8086 processor. Wow. I feel really old now. Yeah. Well, I was surprised to learn this, right? Because I got my first 8086 computer in like 1988, which is 10 years right. after the CPU came to market. Right. So when Yeah, that's about the same as me. I, really? my, first, my first 8086 PC was an Epson computer. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it was uh, one of these ones that had a turbo button. So of course it, did. it was. Uh, you could did you press tape the, it down? No, the turbo button was to slow it down. To uh, Obviously. The, whole point, the whole point of the turbo button was to slow it down to 4.77 megahertz so that applications that expected to be running at 4.77 megahertz yeah. would not just like. So when you're playing a game, the aliens wouldn't fly around at ridiculous speed. It would like. Because games were hardwired for that speed. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Mark, Mark I'm, I, I, I'm going to take an educated guess that you were not an early adopter of the 8086 processor. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, well did you, when did you get on board with Intel PCs? Uh, I think my family's first Intel computer was a uh, Pentium 166 MMX in oh, wow yeah, running wow. Windows 95. I was I was already working. We had an Amiga before that. <laughs> I was already at work at that point. 
So um, it's depressing doing a show with you. <laughs> it really is. The um, the eighty eighty six name comes from the fact that it was um, it was eight sixteen bit registers. I don't believe you. I saw this written down, yeah. and I think you <laughs> made this up. No, I didn't make it up. I double checked my. Yeah, facts but then and you also wrote something about what other series eight oh oh eight eight oh eight oh and eight oh eight five. Does yep. that mean there were eight five bit registers? Is that, no, is that I, what that means? I, I, What's Intel's nomenclature for their CPUs? It's ludicrous. Well, it, it still is today, right? Because what's, yeah. the, what's the name of your processor in your computer today? It's something like an 8087K or something, right? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, I'll but I, 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 <laughs> this, this was cited to the designer of the processor, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that this, this is fact. <laughs> uh, um, it was on Wikipedia. It must no, be. No, no, no. In, in an interview, he was interviewed about this, and this is this comes from the interview that he did. And and this eighty eighty six, uh, the original version, uh, could address one megabyte of RAM. And uh, I remember was, it well. Was DOS five equals high comma UMB. Yeah, oh. and was five oh. five megahertz. And then le in latter years, uh, up uprated to ten megahertz. So this is where the turbo button came from. Right. And the, the the one that I had was a, a ten megahertz and also featured the same turbo button to slow it down. So, so I noticed you you mentioned in here that the Intel was uh, the eighty eighty six was to. Uh, compete with the Zilog Z80, which mm. is very popular in the 8-bit oh, era. Oh, not the bloody Zilog Z80. I know, yeah. right? <laughs> Sorry, which Mark. It's still around now. Yeah. People still use the Z80. It's still manufactured now. But, does, so it was. It hasn't so really, they haven't got a, the, like the a Zilog Pentium version. So They've the, still stuck no, with the Z80. But the fascinating thing about the 8086 is, is it was intended to be a, a short-term skew. It was never intended to be a long-term product. It was designed to compete with... Um, the Zilog Z80 and the Motorola processors, wh while they were working on a new CPU architecture, and 40 years later, it's evolved and evolved and evolved. And, and Intel have dumped billions of dollars, and, and they've tried three times to actually replace the 8086 architecture with, uh, what, what did I find here? It was well, the Itanium. And the yeah, the Itanium, IA the uh, IAPX432, which was apparently the thing that they were waiting to come to market whilst they put out this interim 8086 wow. processor. Do you know the thing that, that fascinates me is that uh, my neighbour wanted to buy a new computer, a laptop for some work stuff. He just wanted to create presentations. And he said, oh, should I buy a Windows one? Or I've heard about these Chromebook things. And I, he said, can you come to the shop with me? And we walked around all the laptop aisles. You know what it's like, where they're all out. And there was a guy from Google there. And uh, I, he said, you, you need to come along because I don't think he knows everything. And I asked just simple stuff like, how much RAM does this laptop have? And the guy went, I don't know. They don't tell us that. <laughs> like, which I thought was ludicrous, but um, they don't really make it clear which of the Chromebooks have Intel like x86 based CPUs, and which ones have ARM CPUs. You have to kind of dig a little bit. Mm. So a normal person is now getting away from that whole ding, da, 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 ding, like CPU stuff, and it's just a laptop. It's just a Chromebook, and I don't care what the the yeah. silicon in the middle of the thing is. The hardware is an irrelevant yeah. thing. It's the Chrome experience exactly. that you're being yeah. sold. Fascinating. Mm. So did they win? Mm. So, well, well so, did, some yeah. would say we so. Um, but in the meantime, marching forward a couple of decades, yeah. what's happening in the news? So I found uh, this, so yours was what, 40 years ago? I found this piece of news from 20 years ago, uh, and it was a post on Slashdot, which still exists. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, and it was a post by Bruce Perens. Uh, he wrote an article because uh, there was a big brouhaha about the licensing under which Qt was made available. And the KDE desktop was in its infancy in those days. And Qt was made available under a not particularly free software friendly license. And the KDE desktop developers chose Qt. And there was a big brouhaha. And uh, Linus Torvalds was quoted as saying, he who writes the code gets to choose the license, and nobody else gets to complain. And there was a herald of all angels behind him as he said it. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce didn't like that. Uh, Bruce wrote a lengthy article about why we should boycott KDE, and it's a terrible thing that KDE should become the default desktop, because they want it to become the default desktop on, on Linux. And that thread... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of comments killed the Slashdot server uh, because of all the neckbeards arguing about which was better, <laughs> no they, more they, KDE. They weren't, they weren't neckbeards then, it was more bum fluff back then. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, of course. But 
it struck me that 20 years ago we were having this conversation yeah. and now there's still people arguing about which is better. But you know what? It's not the developers. It's not the developers no. that are arguing this. Like we talk to known developers all the time. We talk to KDE developers all the time. They are the loveliest people you would ever meet. It's the users and and like people out there as the internet's John O'Bacon would call them, the peanut gallery, mm -hmm. who have an opinion and and want to share that reckon with the world. Yeah. And unfortunately, they've been doing it for years and years and years, and now they have a very wide platform. In the past, 20 years ago, it was Slashdot. Nobody ever saw it. And now it's Twitter and so Exactly. On. But this particular argument, I think, really stunted the adoption of KDE for decades. In fact, two decades, maybe 15 years. Because this whole licensing thing around KDE was one of the reasons why people chose what desktop they were running. It was around the, f the perceived freedom of the, right. the toolkit and the desktop. And I think this really hurt, hurt KDE, even though this, this license issue was quite short-lived because uh, a version of Qt was made available under a free license. With, right, but it wasn't properly, properly free for a and, good long time. Until after. just a few years ago. And right. now we're sitting in a in a world where KDE is really in the ascendancy mm -hmm. uh, because Qt now is under a properly free, you know, all of Qt is under a properly free license. And at the time there were, there were quotes in the article from uh, people such as Miguel de Casa who developed GNOME Desktop as one of the people who developed GNOME Desktop, partly uh, as a reaction to what was going on in the KDE world and the licensing of, of Qt. And uh, yeah, he's done all right for himself, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he has. Yeah, he yeah. works at uh, Microsoft now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, one other We're thing that I thought was funny in this, uh, in this uh, article. The Qt license also doesn't allow free use of Qt, except under the X Windows system people are starting to realize that X won't live forever. <laughs> wow. 20 years 20 ago. 20 years ago. Mind you, just to punctuate that point, Wayland is 10 years old now. No. Yeah. Wow. wow. It's old enough to play Fortnite. Yeah, wow. it is. <laughs> but ironically, can't it play can't Fortnite. Play Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Slip us up a gear, please. <laughs> right, so I, I found I found some stories from ten years ago because I remember that. Um, <laughs> I hate you. And ten years ago in June, Firefox three was released, which was down. Yeah, think about that. And not only was it right, so, this was Firefox version three. Firefox version one came out four years before that, so they were releasing at the time a, a major version every two years. Um, we're, we're, what are we on now? Like Firefox 47,000. 4,005. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. So the release cadence of browsers has changed quite significantly since this. Um, when it was released, there was a, there was a big sort of uh, fanfare from Mozilla about this. And there was an estimated 8 million downloads in the first 24 hours, which is... That's pretty impressive. Which for is back, pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. For back then in... Yeah. 10 years ago. 10 years ago, yeah. 2008. Not it's not that good, really, is it? <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, People had iPhones 10 years ago. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah, it, but they didn't have a lot of choice of browser. It was this time. It was It was, IE it was or basically Firefox. IE or Firefox at this point. Yeah. Mm. So this was people who were making a choice about their browser. Right. But they were making a choice because the alternative was rubbish. <laughs> right. That's yes. why they were making that choice. Not because yeah, I'm pretty sure in 2008 yes. it was still IE6, which hadn't been updated yeah. for several right. years. Yeah. So this was this was you know people becoming educated about the fact that the browser you used was a choice. Yes. And I, I and remember working in corporate environments yeah. around about that time when before it was fi what was it called before it was uh, Phoenix Phoenix. Uh, Firebird, 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 Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. One Firebird. of those five yeah. different names. Yeah. That could this be is before. Straight. This was. Bef yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, other, other, other interesting. <laughs> other interesting things about Firefox. So it was the debut of the Awesome Bar, which was where they. Wow. So this is the. the we don't address call it bar, that anymore. Do the we? address bar where you. I still call it that. I think it's a cool name. This okay. is the address bar where Millennial. you can type in, and it will like search your history and your bookmarks and whatever else. And give you all can. your keyboard key presses to Google, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Possibly. Right. Well, well, Chrome doesn't do it in quite the same way, so I assume not. But who knows? Um, you no, know, because it doesn't always. It doesn't necessarily search the web, but it searches like so. You can type in like the, in your history. You can think, oh well, I was on this site, and there was this word in that article, and like it. That's what I do. And it'll like, find everyone it. else seems to tell me that I should use bookmarks, but I just yeah, type and let exactly. Google. Actually, 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 oh, find it was, stuff. Oh, it was on Reddit, ha and it had this in the name. So you type reddit.com space, and then the name that was in the title, and it finds it in your history. Perfect. Mm, yeah. yeah. So hands up, everyone here who maintains bookmarks still in their browser. Wow, weirdos. That's 56? around about half people. 60%? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yes. Huh. At least half. At least half the people haven't moved on. Yes. And um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this was this was in June two thousand and eight. In June two thousand and nine, we saw the first Chrome developer preview released. So in between this, Chromium became available and buildable on Linux. But Chrome Chrome developer preview was the the first official Google Chrome build available. Yeah. And Linux. now they are based. The the basis of Chrome is now the number one selling laptops. Yeah. In yeah. 2018. So that yeah. was nine years it took for that to happen. So total ascendancy in 10 years, because yeah. they're by far the largest browser market share in terms of just browsers on the desktop. Right. And then we think of Electron as well, Electron applications. Got to get are, the Electron mentioned in. I, I've, I've got a pin and everything that goes <laughs> now. Um, but, you know, that's the popular platform for developing desktop applications now, right. and that's based on Chromium and therefore yeah. Chrome. Wow. Yeah, and indeed mobile apps with that are built with um, Cordova, PhoneGap. Uh, yep. they're they're based on at least a WebKit um, environment, yep. if not Chrome itself. Although it is good to point out that at least WebKit did uh, originate from KDE that we yep. were talking about oh, earlier. Oh, KHTML. Yeah, it's KHTML yeah, yeah. originally. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we have a couple of minutes just to sort of uh, set the perspective. So Mark is now in 2008. We've, we've br brought you forward from 1978 to 2008. In 2008, <laughs> Ubuntu, <laughs> <laughs> Ubuntu Hardy Heron 804 w was the current LTS, and it was running Linux kernel 2.624 and the GNOME 2.22 desktop. So this was pre-Unity. This is so, pre-Unity. So that's when it looked just like Ubuntu Mate. Right? It looks exactly like right. Ubuntu Mate. But brown. <laughs> Uh, and it was the first release to feature Pulse Audio wow. as the default audio subsystem. People hated us for that, yeah, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. Leonard! The <laughs> end of Ubuntu. Yeah, it's the end yep. of Ubuntu. Uh, but it was also the first release to feature the uncomplicated firewall, which I've loved ever since. For 10 years, I've loved that uh, little firewall application. Uh -huh. And it was also the first version to feature the Ubuntu Netbook. Oh, I remember Netbooks. I had a Netbook. Yeah. Well, and, and I it goes on. So I, I pulled out some sort of top news from 2008. So other top news was uh, the default file system was still... Th sorry, this is top technology news. Top I've just read some of these headlines. Top news. Yeah. <laughs> Top tech news, uh, but also uh, Rory Kethel and Jones wouldn't be reporting the following things. <laughs> uh, well, he was he, he was a big fan of people in their bedrooms making Linux back then, wasn't right, he? Yeah, yeah. But um, X3 was still the default, and Ted So was just testing X4 on his own laptop at the time. So it's just as X4 was becoming stable. Wine One was released. HD DVD lost the high def format wars to Blu-ray in two thousand and eight. Netbooks were a uh, success story. For a bit, For that 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 was that year, very short-lived. Yeah, yes. it, but they were a success. And ebook readers emerged in two thousand and eight. It was the year that everyone made ebook readers. Flexible displays were first prototyped and and demonstrated in two thousand and eight, with the promise that they would be a real thing in two thousand and eleven. Um, and then we had Bendgate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, swimmers smashed world <laughs> records at the 2008 Winter Olympics with the uh, Speedo laser swimsuits, which are now banned from competitive what? competition. Do you not remember this? No, I'm not a big swimmer. Uh, they, were, they were, they were, they were yeah. desi uh, designed around the skin surface of dolphins, and these swimmers all smashed seconds off Olympic world records and what have you. Uh, USB 3 was introduced in wow. 2008. Ten years ago. Still with yeah. a rubbish connector. Yeah. yeah, and the smartphone wars were just around the corner as the Android G1 was launched. Wow. Thank you for joining us on our trip through the time trumpet. Uh, I think we should probably move on. Joe. So, uh, those of you that came last year will remember that Alan set a challenge for Mark and I. And this year, I've decided to set a challenge for Alan and Mark. Not because Martin was out the country and couldn't This has to nothing to do with the fact <laughs> that I haven't been around for the last two weeks whatsoever. Um, so, it's something that we've discussed on the podcast a few times, which is um, contribute the many ways that you can contribute to open source. And we talk the story, but the fact is, can we actually deliver on this. So I I set out some rules here and, and, and this was called working lunch open source contributions. So the rules of the game are this. Um, set aside an hour or so a day to contribute to two open source projects. 
spend up to two and a half hours, well, more, if you're really enjoying it, per project. Oh, hello. That's your daughter. The c tell her the cookies are in the lower shelf of the fridge. Um, use your two and a half hours over that week, uh, or all at once, if you like, uh, and contribute however you see fit. For example, with code or documentation or bug triage, just examples. However, we are going to controversially veto one form of contribution, which is no bug reports, which we all actually believe in strongly, but we're going to rule that out as a, as a means because of Because we all do it already. Well, yeah. I, think, I think, yeah, but it also doesn't help that like we arrive and go, I'm here to help. Here are a bunch of bug reports. Here's two and a half <laughs> hours of bug reports. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Stuart I'm helping. Language. <laughs> <laughs> so let's find out how Mark and Alan got on. So first of all, Mark, uh, what was the first project that you My decided? My first project was Drupal, Drupal the content management system. Okay. When you work on Moodle, this seemed like a logical... Yes, so I, yeah, I work on Moodle, which is a PHP virtual learning environment web application, and Drupal is a PHP... Um, content management system. Okay. So it seemed like an easy thing for me to get into. How did you get started? Uh, so first of all, I went to their website and I found they had a link for getting involved. So I had a look at that. Um, they have a list of ways in which you can contribute. So I went for the development option because as a software developer, that seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, and then they had a page which was telling you how to set up your development environment. Um, now, the thing about looking at the documentation for how to contribute on Drupal is that there's lots and lots of lists which tell you lots of different ways that you can do things in different ways. So there are about 30 different ways to set up your development environment. <laughs> so the first one I tried was downloading a, um, a config file for a system called Vagrant, which automatically sets up virtual uh, machines. And I ran that. And just as happened every time I've tried to set up any development environment using a Vagrant file, it failed. And I couldn't work out why. And I wasn't going to spend my hour working out why this wouldn't work. Totally committed to this task then. No. So instead, <laughs> instead, I moved on to a different way of setting up my development right. environment, which I was more confident I'd be able to do in an hour. Which, Don't worry. You'll, which, be have, you'll have an opportunity to have a go back in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so I set, up, I set up a local Apache MySQL PHP installation and got Drupal installed within an hour, just about. Um, the following hours, I then spent actually contributing to the project. Now, I, I couldn't find any kind of list of, you know, easy bugs for a new person to Drupal to get into. And Drupal is a massive system with lots of different components. So I found it kind of a bit daunting. And I just kind of panicked a bit when I just looked at this list of bugs. I thought, I don't know how I'm going to start doing this. So what I decided to do instead was um, code reviews. Because as well as there being bugs open for people to fix, there's bugs where people have submitted patches and the patches need reviews so they can then actually be sent for integration into the product. So I found um, I found two reviews which I could do. One of them was um, a config file for um, a tool called ESLint, which checks that your JavaScript style is correct. Um, and basically the... Um, the file had a load of ones or twos as to whether it would throw an error or a warning. And they decided that it would be better if it said error or warn so that you could understand it without having to refer to the ESLint documentation. So I reviewed that. That was easy. And the other thing was um, an update to some code documentation where someone had written a description of what a bit of code did, which was really, really hard to understand. So they rewrote it and I reviewed what they'd rewritten. And how, how easy was it to get involved in that? Like what, like, that, that to go and get that code, yeah. review it, and then inform them that you had reviewed it and you were happy with that it. That was so there was there was a page which had the there were sort of four steps to go through when you're doing a review. You look at the patch, you make sure it makes sense, you apply the patch, you make sure it works, you make sure it does what it was meant to do, and then in the bug tracker, you write a comment, it tells you what kind of things to say in your comment, and then you set the status to reviewed by the community. And do they accept reviews from random Joe Nobody who just turns up and says, yeah, that looks good. Hey, whoop, bing. Yes, they do. Wow. Okay. But I, that, that's, not, that's not it. That's not, you know, I mean, the, the, same, the end the same, of the process. Exactly. The same thing happens with Moodle. There's a peer review process and then there's an integration review process where the person who's actually managing the code base looks at it. But it has to have an initial, just sort of like someone who vaguely understands what's going on, looks at it and make sure that it's okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, Alan, what was the first project you decided to contribute to? So the first to? project I decided, uh, we originally decided I was not allowed to contribute to Ubuntu. <laughs> um, Seem, seems reasonable. Yeah. So I chose Debian, uh, which felt... <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> ...nearby and would help other people. Um, and I had learned of a tool 
which looked really awesome for people who want to get involved in Debian and get involved in contributing. And it's called How Can I Help? And it's actually something you can install on your system. Apt install how-can-i-help. And once you've installed it, if you run How Can I Help, and also every time it gets updated when you apt upgrade, it spits out a list of calls to help, things you could do which would help the Debian project. And I thought, that's a good way for me to get started. I'll answer their call for help. So I ran, how can I help? And the- the I can see where this is going. <laughs> the list of um, things you could do are categorized. Uh, new packages where help is needed, including orphaned ones. New bugs suitable for new contributors. Uh, they're tagged newcomer. New bugs affecting Debian infrastructure. Uh, new packages removed from Debian testing. Maintainer might need help. Uh, new packages going to be removed from Debian. Maintainer might need help. Or new packages waiting for sponsorship. And I went through basically every single bug in the list. And I had no clue <laughs> how to help. I am... <laughs> I am not a programmer, and I looked at all of these ways of contributing through this How Can I Help, and they were all, you need to adopt this package and take ownership right. of it because nobody else now So a big commitment. It. This isn't, yeah, a, this isn't a, a two-hour thing. This isn't a l working lunch, yes. right? This is a job, yes. right? <laughs> uh, so I, <laughs> I was a little bit frustrated at this and um, essentially gave up. I went through multiple times, over multiple lunch times, clicking through the bugs, reading them, and every so often I'd find a bug that said, yeah, I think this needs a significant time investment, I'll mark it newcomer, and somebody who comes along might be able to do it. And it might be, you, generally you would need to know whichever the individual product was, the individual application or deb, you would need to be fairly competent for that specific package to be able to contribute to any of these things. Okay. And I think it was really targeted at developers, like yeah. proper developers with a developer propeller hat on, not <laughs> <laughs> me, pretend developer, I play one on TV, right? <laughs> play one on a podcast. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so actually, I, I called that right off. I, I didn't actually get to contribute to Debian at all. Okay, interesting. So before we move on to the other projects, Mark, if we may be so bold, do you have any feedback for Drupal as to how that process could have been improved in terms of how you got involved in what? I, th I think that there are two things I would say is one, have a clear list of bugs that would be good for new contributors uh, who don't already know about the whole architecture of Drupal. And secondly, uh, cut down on the lists in the documentation so that people have one way of setting up their development environment. And there's like, there is, it's, there's lots of other areas where you go onto a page of how to do this and there's 20, 30 things there. So mm -hmm. cut down on the lists and have a, a, some clear paths in for new contributors. Okay, and, and Alan? How can I help should in, uh, also have things that are not so developer focused. Mm -hmm. And I realize that's hard because mm -hmm. when you think about what Debian is, you know, mm -hmm. it's a collection of other people's software mostly that's packaged by Debian developers. And I, I don't necessarily want to be a Debian developer. I want to help make it better. Mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily want to commit to being a DD. But, docu but signposting documentation improvements yeah. that might that be kind of required. Thing. Yeah, Dru Confirming bu bugs and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Drupal has a lot of a lot of things like that. Like one of the things they say is add tags to our documentation as a as a really like lightweight new thing you can do. So yeah, there's definitely like things that even though it's a development project, there's definitely a lot of things that you can do that aren't development right. focused. Okay, so moving on, Mark, what was the second project that you decided to contribute to? So for the second project, I wanted to go for something which wasn't a massive system with loads and loads of contributors. I wanted to try and go for a smaller project. And by chance, I've been playing around with KDE and I stumbled across the Active Window Control widget. What does that do? Uh, which is something you put in your panel and it shows the like close, maximize, minimize buttons in the panel instead of in the window. Ah, right. Yes. Right, so I was... Like Unity. <laughs> Yes, exactly like Unity. Like Marto Window App, that's um, what you what you actually <laughs> So um so I was looking at this and I noticed some comments in the comments thread on KDE store, which is where you download new widgets from, um, saying that the version in KDE store wasn't the latest version and you had to go here and build it yourself if you want the latest version. Uh, we, uh, so I followed the link and it went to a system called Fabricator, spelt with a PH, which looks a bit like kind of Launchpad and GitHub and GitLab and that sort of thing for hosting and managing your code. But basically all of the KDE stuff appears to be on an instance of Fabricator. Um, so I managed to find the Git repository and download 
the code and then I ran, I found the install file and ran the commands and I got a load of things about saying, oh, we can't find this thing, which apparently you need, but you haven't been told. So I spent probably about an hour going through running and Googling and finding the right answer on the internet for each of these errors and what it meant I had to install first. So I decided that my contribution was going to be, I would update the install file saying, before you run this command, install all of these packages. So I updated the install file. I then had to find out how to contribute this back, which it turns out is a bit of an unusual process on Fabricator compared to what I've used on other systems. So instead of... I love the face you pull every time you say Fabricator. Fabricator, yes. I, rewind I feel, the video. I feel, if you're I watching feel, the video, I you need to rewind. I feel the PH yeah, needs, it, needs extra emphasis. It there. does sound like something my daughter would have named. Yes. Um, so, so what you do on Fabricator um, <laughs> is instead of, instead of making a, uh, a Git thing somewhere and pushing a pushing a git repository and then asking for it to be pulled into the main git repository you go to a form and it says paste your diff in here or upload it here so you have to make a patch and then you have to stick that in a web form and then you submit that and then it says okay now describe what it's doing so then you're kind of making a bug report and telling it which project it's linked to and then you have to tell who you need to review it so i had to look in the git history and work out who was the most active contributor and then get tell tag him yeah, you're basically, it <laughs> that's basically what i did and so it's now sitting for review I've, I've, and I've hopefully already, it'll get reviewed i've already forgotten why you were doing this <laughs> <laughs> so that i could build the latest version of active window control widget why did you need the latest version uh, because it said that it fixed a bug which it didn't <laughs> <laughs> brilliant okay so that was my adventures in KDE. Alan, Alan what was your second project you chose to... Um... KDE. Oh. <laughs> Every, everyone's doing it, apparently. Yeah, so uh, I did a search on the KDE bug tracker. I thought I'd try and triage or confirm some new bugs. I thought, that's an easy thing. I'll were you, were you also searching in Fabricator? No, I wasn't using <laughs> Fabricator. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> what I decided to do was just go to the KDE bug tracker, just a Google search KDE bug tracker, and just looked for bugs that looked like they were non-confirmed. Um, and I found one that was to do with KDE Connect. And I thought, ah, I'm running KDE Connect on my laptop, and I've got it on my phone. I'll have a go at that. So <laughs> I looked at that bug. and <laughs> I can see where this is going as And well. it said, uh, <laughs> you need to update KDE Connect on your phone to the beta version. So I did that. Um, and I had How? to opt in. How? Uh, it, uh, well, I, you opt in on the Google Play Store to oh, the betas. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 right, right. right. The, right. The client and then side, I okay. tried sending a file. This, the problem was, the bug was, you can't send a file from your phone to your laptop, right? Yep. Um, so I tried reproducing it, and sure enough, it failed for me too. Um, I tried reverting the beta to go back to the stable version, and I tried all kinds of other things. Um, and that took me about 20 minutes. And at the end of it, I got uh, wrote a comment that said, yep, I've reproduced that. And here's a screenshot of the problem. And later on, I had a follow up from whoever is the maintainer asking further questions. And so actually, it looked like a useful thing because the person who originally filed the bug, it looks like English wasn't his first language because mm -hmm. it was a bit garbled, the, the mm -hmm. bug report. So I think I helped there. Yes. Great. In 20 minutes. Then so what did you do with your other hour and 40 minutes? <laughs> I spent way more than an hour and 40 minutes because I was trying to make up for my failure with Debian. <laughs> um, so some bugs were just unreproducible by the original bug author. Here's a crash, but I don't know what happened and I can't reproduce it. So I thought, well, I'm not going to have any Every luck there. Every launch pad <laughs> bug, bug ever. ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, quite a few of those. Um, I found one where it said... Uh, uh, they're having a problem dragging a window to another monitor. And at the time, I was sat on a train. I didn't have another monitor <laughs> with me. So I thought, okay, I'll mark that one to have a look at later. I never got back to it. Um, then I looked at one um, that said something about if you enable this plasmoid, this thing happens. I don't know what a plasmoid is. So I, I had to Google what is a plasmoid. It sounds like first. it needs to be surgically removed. Right. <laughs> I, I spent 10 minutes trying to install this widget thing. I uninstalled it, installed it, couldn't. And no matter what I did, the widget wouldn't appear on the list of things I could do. Um, and I gave up in frustration again because I got really annoyed. that I couldn't actually even get to the point that the guy was trying to get to to make the thing work, let alone make it break. So that annoyed me. Um, so, and that was 40 minutes, right? Um, I then thought, 
the next day, so this is Tuesday, 8.15. I've, <laughs> dude, I've got all week here. <laughs> like, we have three <laughs> minutes left. 8.15, uh, I thought, I'll take another tack. I googled for contribute to KDE. I thought, maybe I should have done this yesterday. <laughs> but no. And I found a website, and it was called uh, community.kde.org, get involved. And it turns out I'm doing the right thing. It, one of the things was go through and triage uh, existing bugs, you know, leave comments, screenshots, make sure they're good quality bug reports. Um, I got a reply to my KDE Connect bug, further on replied to that, 20 minutes spent there. Then I thought, I know, I've got another way I can contribute to KDE. I wrote a blog post. I reviewed the KDE Slimbook oh, laptop. That is... <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That took me an hour. I got <laughs> retweeted by the KDE community it Twitter did. account. It did. I think that's valid. Um, and then I found myself repeatedly going back to the KDE bug tracker whenever I got a spare moment and having a look for them. And actually it's quite a pleasant experience. So there's a nice URL listed from the Get Involved page, which tells you how to get to unconfirmed new bugs in chronological order. Super easy to just like go through them one by one, find ones that I could maybe reproduce and actually help. So yeah, I found that quite useful and I will probably carry on doing that. Brilliant. Awesome. Brilliant. So quite a lot of frustration and anger from your point of view, but also some productive outcome. Y you found your niche, I think, with KDE. You found yeah. a way that you Get could contribute. Get someone to send me a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> step one. No, but yeah, I, the, the bug reporting stuff and like triaging other people's bugs and helping the developers yeah. know that actually, yeah, this is an issue and here's the version it happens. Because some of them, the bug reports were just like, this thing crashed, I don't know what, and I'm on KDE, whatever. I yeah. actually like added a bit of detail. So and I thought so that was useful. Taking these projects and, and j just ignoring the projects for the moment, it sounds like actually contributing to open source is hard. Uh, if you're not a developer, yeah, yeah, it turns out it is quite hard. Yeah. And yeah. all those times I've told people you should get contributed, <laughs> yeah. I feel a bit bad now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, and, and so we've learned something from yeah. that. So, Fortunately, I'm a developer, so it was really easy for me. Yeah, but yeah, I, I can appreciate why it would not be easy for a myself to contribute to some some particular areas of you know the things that i know about if i went to a different project like gnome i think i would struggle in similar ways um so maybe not these projects in particular but we need better signposting and uh instructions and documentation on how to actually g get over the threshold uh and to find ways to contribute that are not just developer focused i'd be interested to hear from our listeners if they've tried contributing something new yeah that they haven't touched before Send us an email, show at ubuntupodcast.org. Let us know how that got on. Yep. Or and if, they, if they haven't tried before, give it a try and then send us their feedback. <laughs> and just like that, 45 German minutes are over. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> thanks everyone for coming yes. thank you very much uh, it's very good of you to join me in the time trumpet and listen to us whitter on about how terrible I am at contributing to open source enjoy the rest of the evening yes. and yes. the rest of the podcasts we still have two shows to come yep. we have um, one of them which is called <laughs> Linux Voice <laughs> and then we have the drunken mashup at the end yep but now is the time to go upstairs and order your food yes, yes. bye thanks bye so bye. much bye <laughs>